Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Scott Polikoff. I'm a town planner. And Monty Anderson, who is a developer and friend, he and I are going to tag team this and tell you a story about a particular community, uh, but then try and broaden out the uh, lessons learned about using the form-based approach for reinventing a Main Street environment uh, where incremental development and open source development opportunities uh, are facilitated. And the bottom line is effectively creating a de facto master developer context across multiple ownership. That's really what we're talking about. Uh, Monty has uh, been in the southern sector of Dallas County uh, and the uh, counties below, below the Trinity River, developing and working as a broker for many years. And we've been working in the Dallas Fort Worth area. We have a national practice, but in particular, uh, I met Monty. Uh, and we became fast friends, and we began to realize that we have uh, complementary philosophies on how to really open up the opportunity for redevelopment. And so I'm going to give you some kind of overarching things to think about. Then we're going to talk about how Monty came in and brought a guerrilla movement to Duncanville, Texas, how we then built on that guerrilla movement and institutionalized what he was doing, and then now what Monty's doing to take advantage of the institutional support. You know, the, the whole system of development or redevelopment once upon a time was supported by folks such as the Medici family in Venice and the Renaissance where the bankers and the uh, art patrons uh, uh, and the investors and the developers all understood a common outcome and that's the beauty of cities. And that, dro that drove in many ways the outcome. What we want to talk about today is how to go back to that approach on an incremental basis and to harness the local government capacity to support that. And uh, so we're not talking about something that hasn't already been a part of our culture and fabric. Uh, it's just a question of how to go back to it in a modern context. Now, today, many decisions, as you know, of course, CNU has been involved with the Fannie Freddie reforms in terms of trying to encourage uh, more latitude in the ability to secure uh, secondary mortgage financing uh, for mixed use uh, to overcome the limitations. On Main Street, that's a big deal because you're talking about a five or six thousand square foot building and you're talking about a fifty percent of that building being commercial, say three thousand square feet, it's not going to be eligible typically for a federally backed uh, debt instrument. And that's driving the kinds of development and redevelopment that are occurring. Now there's a lot of concern about what are the rules of the game, where are we headed, what's the underlying economic justification for what we're doing. And, you know, whether you're talking about uh, take back, uh, occupy, uh, throw them all out, the Tea Party, these folks are tapping into a concern that the system is no longer functioning in a way that is going to give us returns based on the value proposition. And the value proposition was the basis for Main Street development. Now, I've borrowed these slides from Seth Harry uh, because I think it's really important as we go through this presentation to understand what was the original relationship between the engines of the economy in terms of development and retail and transportation and how they became disaggregated and what then is the opportunity to put them back together. So originally you can see in the schematic, he developed this for Omaha, but actually it goes uh, the wrong direction. Uh, but you know, if you have the old gridded street system, it was a symbiotic environment with the old downtown department store. And that was the core retailing environment. And then with the uh, uh, advent of the bypass highway, then retailing and the Main Street format began to change. We started breaking apart because of the lack of walkability and the continuity of neighborhood fabric around the retail format. You got the, the bypass mall, and you were there for one reason, one reason only, to shop. And then when this format became obsolete, so did the uh, locations. Now, it's interesting. Most of these are either infill or have redeveloped. I mean, that's how far along we've come. And then, of course, the large-scale uh, commuter urban highway system, which originally was supposed to be for the I interstate movement, but it became really for the movement of going to work and going home and going shopping, with the one way in and one way out uh, neighborhood subdivision, and that format then evolved into the regional mall. 
So the question is, how do we kind of get back to the structure that worked in terms of the economy that the Medici's understood when they were the bankers of the Renaissance, uh, but somehow we've lost our way, and certainly the reforms of the Federal Housing Administration, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, have less, left us with these uh, commoditized products of development. And I think the answer is the new de facto master developer is the form-based approach. Now, the purpose of this presentation is not to get into the details of form-based coding. Certainly, though, if you want to ask questions or you have comments, we encourage that. But I think it's really, really important to note that when we talk about form-based, it's not just the code. It's the whole process. And, and those of you who are looking at doing a form-based code as a facilitator, as a regulatory tool to encourage more walkable urbanism, remember you have to first do the plan. You have to do the market study. You have to understand the infrastructure. The code is just a successional tool that facilitates the broader form-based approach where use becomes secondary or tertiary because we're putting in place a mechanism where the market does a better job of evolving uses in and out of particular building types and down the block because we've established a framework where the form is based on the relationship of the public space, the private realm around the buildings, the public realm that is formed by the buildings and the streets, and then the walkability and the anchoring of the neighborhood system. And so form-based is not fundamentally an aesthetic approach, it's an economic approach. And I think that's what Monty and I really want to reinforce today. Now, um, Monty and I came together, and uh, Monty was in uh, Duncanville, Texas, which is south of Dallas. It's landlocked. It's potentially the next stop on the red line going south down, uh, the dart line going south down, uh, south of Dallas. Uh, it's uh, a mixed, uh, uh, diverse community racially uh, in terms of its economy, and it has a, has a linear downtown, which is effectively a major commuter arterial that connects two major highways with a railroad on one side. And Monty saw an opportunity to begin to take advantage of its location. Um, you know, if any of you have seen Andrew Burleson's presentation on the commoditization of real estate where we've turned everything into a homogenous product that can be fungibly moved around and traded versus what is really the value of real estate and it's its unique attributes in terms of its location and what you can do with it in terms of that particular location. And so Monty saw this as an opportunity given the tremendous location of Duncanville. So Monty's going to come up now and kind of tell you about where he got his start in seeing the opportunity on Main Street in Duncanville, uh, a first ring suburb on the south side of Dallas. Thank you. My name is Monty Anderson, and uh, for, for uh, 20 years ago, what I started off doing was uh, real estate brokerage. And I was one of these commercial real estate guys that just ran around the southern Dallas County leasing space. Just, and I, I was doing about 150 deals a year. So that's a whole lot of deals for a commercial real estate broker. And um, so I, I had made it my mission to stay in southern Dallas County, which is kind of the wrong side of the railroad tracks in Dallas, if you will. And that's where I grew up. And I grew up in a mixed community, and I saw a lot of deterioration. I watched deterioration in the in the city, and then in Oak Cliff, which is uh, the southern part of downtown Dallas, and then the first ring suburbs, and now into the second ring suburbs. So over the years, uh, I became an activist first um, as a as a real estate broker. I became an activist for just a better community and tried to just clean up the trash in the community. And along the way, we realized that until we changed the way we thought about our communities, we were always going to be cleaning up the trash forever and still we, until we started to love our communities. And so that's where I discovered uh, CNU. My first CNU was back in 2003 in Pasadena, and so I've been uh, ever since. But I was already doing mix of uses and, and other things, just didn't know what I, exactly what I was doing. So um, along the way, uh, downtown Duncanville, uh, was a, was the place that attracted me, and the MPO, the North Texas uh, Council of Governments, had, had said that over the this was in the early 2000s, it was actually going to lose population over the next 10 years, which has not happened because of what we've done. 
So the first thing we did was we started buying old buildings right in the middle of town and repurposing them, trying to get uh, businesses in those buildings that would actually do something. So in a retail business like this one here, it's a, it's a, it was an old, ugly uh, real estate office, and we got a pet store that did pet grooming and saltwater fish. So I always said the retailer in these kind of locations had to be doing something with their hands in the back room or otherwise they go insane waiting for customers to come in. So on this street, we were getting about $6 a square foot in rents when we first started, which is very, very low. That's per year, not per month. That was per year. And um, so this, this uh, particular business, the first one, um, does about a million dollars a year in pet grooming and saltwater fish now. And secondly, uh, very close, because we stay very close. And anything that we do, we're staying very close. One affects another and another, just so we're staying very close uh, to the center. Uh, this was an old post office, and we turned, we turned this into a, a call center, 24-hour call center. Today, if you call 1-800-ORDER-A-DALLAS-COWBOY-JERSEY, this is where you're calling is, is Duncanville, Texas. It's open 24 hours a day. Uh, there was a, there's an old air conditioning um, shop um, connected to all these buildings, and we turned this into the outreach center, the community outreach center. And some of the people were criticizing me saying you're just bringing poor people in. I said, well, the poor people are already here. They just need help. And this is a hugely, uh, huge traffic uh, generator into the, to the mix of the core. So we bought those three buildings and converted them. And then we decided, um, well, we needed to do something, something new. And so uh, the first building, um, let's see here. Oh, there it is. The first buildings that you looked at were, were here and here and here. And so the city had, the, the old city hall was at the corner. This is at the corner of Main and Center. And so um, we partnered, decided to partner with the city of Duncanville uh, on a mixed use 22,000 square foot building. It was 11,000 square foot of retail on the bottom and then 11,000 square foot, only 14 units of retail, on, I mean residential on the top. And it was about an estimated $3 million um, cost for the whole project. And we needed to get, to do a $3 million building, you just have to take my word for a minute, you need to get about 20 or $22 a square foot to make the rents work. Well, we're getting $6 a square foot on Main Street, Duncanville. So we had to figure out what to do to bridge that gap. So the, the Economic Development Corporation of Duncanville contributed $800,000 in cash, uh, land, and, uh, and and uh, permits and fees. The developer, we had to put in $400,000, which left us a $1.8 million loan. At that level, we could lease the space for like $16, 15 to $16 a square foot and make it work. The problem with that was that the city was going to get a huge amount of criticism for giving us $800,000, which is nearly 30% of a project like this, and they couldn't do that. So uh, I'll tell you what we did in a minute to, with them. So we built this project right here, which is now, uh, we built this in 2004. It's now very successful. It stays 100% leased all the time with a waiting list for the loft apartments upstairs. We have a sushi restaurant, an Italian restaurant, a cigar store, a spa, those kinds of uses. And the rents, yeah, the rents on the, on the uh, residential are um, $1.20 a square foot per month, and downstairs on the retail, there's $16 a square foot per month. The highest rents in Duncanville for, for multifamily before this was about 90 cents a square foot. As you can see, we've got parallel parking on one of the streets and head-in parking on the other. And so what we did was uh, we, we don't get any tax abatement. We didn't get any grants or incentives. But what we did was we formed a partnership with the Duncanville Community Economic Development Corporation. We made it where they own 30% of, of the property and we own 70 percent and today that's what we we still have in, in place today now what they agreed to do was they agreed to take their returns 10 years down the road so in the beginning the the city still has it on their balance sheet with no with no incentives and they take their return uh, down the road so the rents at main station are, are now tripling what's on the street and this created main momentum for the, the Main Street uh, form based code that Scott's going to talk about again right now. Well, in the work we do in the form based code and town planning environment, we always try and find somebody who's already got some movement. Whether it's a destination, a restaurant, uh, whether there is um, some sort of leakage 
where the rent structure is, is, is really not reflective of the development potential. And what Monty was talking about, I think this is critical. For those of us that are town planners, if you don't understand what Monty said in terms of the cost of construction and delivering that building at a rent structure that didn't match it, then that's not saying that Main Station didn't make sense there. That was saying that in order to overcome the cost of entry into that market and to reverse mm -hmm. the leakage of people driving away and not spending their money at Toshio's sushi restaurant, that's where the public sector has to become effectively the developer's partner. And, you know, anybody who says that that is communism or whatever you want to call it will know that's actually the positive role of government in a capitalist environment. It's just the opposite. Uh, that's, and by the way, in Texas, we're a conservative Republican state, but we don't have much in the way of the Tea Party influence because even conservative Republicans in Texas understand that there's an important role for government in public-private partnerships. And so this is really building on that. While Monty was starting in his guerrilla movement to bring in redevelopment in a great location with this great access to Dallas to the north and right just below I-20, the community had already gone through a process where they were envisioning a reinvention of Main Street. And so we were hired to quarterback the development of a long-range plan. And by the way, I don't think you can calibrate form-based codes if you don't do a block-level calibrating plan. Uh, we have 20 form-based codes that have been adopted, about 15,000 urban acres. 19 of those 20 codes are mandatory rezonings across multiple ownership. We only have one that is a floating zone or parallel code. The challenge with floating zones or parallel codes is that there's no predictability. So if, if I purchase, uh, and we went through a process with Kim Lee Horner as our subconsultant of analyzing the building fabric, but if I buy this block up here, which is uh, uh, some lawnmower repair shops, some, some tin buildings, and I can't tell my banker or my equity partner, and he or she asks me, what's going to happen down here? And I say, well, under the conventional zoning, I, you know, it could be some use, but we don't know how it's going to address our property. We don't know how it's going to address the street. We don't know what the essential relationship is of the design of the, of, and the function of the project. That makes it virtually impossible to underwrite. And so please consider taking the time to identify which corridor, which parts of town, or which sector, which neighborhood. The appropriate planning makes sense so that you can go through a formal rezoning process. Not to rezone under the new rules means that the new rules really have no market capacity. Because if it's a floating zone or a parallel code, who knows whether or not this property owner down the street is either going to use the old zoning rules or the new zoning rules. And without that predictability, you find that it's hard to underwrite the value proposition because the form-based approach is about incremental value back and forth from property to property. I think the best way to think about it is form-based is about transitions. Conventional zoning is about buffers. We don't care what happens next to us as long as we get that masonry wall. We make sure that the sign that they're getting put up on that new convenience store is not offensive. But other than that, there's no value proposition for us with what's happening down the street. So you have to go through the planning process to have a coherent vision of what ultimately is going to happen from property to property. You also have to remember that you're affecting the bottom line of people that are already there. And I've got to tell you something. There is no bigger outcry than when you talk about, you know, we're going to help you. And they go, yeah, by taking away my parking because you're going to do something cool? You know, I have three parking spots. That's my lifeblood. Well, it's probably not entirely their lifeblood, but teaser parking makes a difference. And if you want to start counting votes down at the city council for the rezoning, and you've got small business people that are whispering in their ear that this is going to be great for Monty Anderson, but if I lose my three parking spots, it's not going to be great for my TV repair shop, you've got to be very, very sensitive to that. So you've got to do the work on the front end before you get into the form-based rezoning. You have to analyze the existing parking, the fabric of the environment, and then you also have to make sure that the engineering community and just the you know, community at large is going to buy into the changes. Because when you are reinventing a downtown that involves a commuter roadway going through the middle of it, and virtually every downtown has that condition, whether it's a state highway or not, and this is now looking not north-south, but this is now looking 
uh, it's it runs runs north south, but you know you've got a rail line on the on the west side and the downtown on the east side. But if you're talking about reinventing the street to create a better match with the street as a destination and not just as a way to move traffic through your downtown, then you have to analyze the traffic impacts. You have to analyze the level of service. But remember, you need to define on the front end what that means when you go through that process. So, for example. You also want to include the pedestrian level of service at major intersections in your downtown when you're talking about a redevelopment strategy, not just the vehicular level of service. Is it, is it convenient and safe for the human beings that you're serving there to also move around? Now, what we found in looking at the traffic and the parking is the northbound and southbound traffic was about the same in the peak hour in the morning and afternoon. Now, this is the new master plan that we developed about two-thirds of a mile you can see the brown are the proposed new buildings and the gray are the existing buildings that we recommend should stay. Uh, by the way, there's Main Station uh, right there in that corner. There's the pet shop. And this is where you're going to have a future TOD. What we realized is that if we looked at taking one of the northbound lanes and moving it into the context of an access lane or Parisian slip lane, that we could still pretty much accommodate the basic capacity northbound, but that we created what I call the hangout factor, which is is somebody willing to spend when in Texas the two months available, one in the spring and one in the fall, the two months available for you to actually sit outside and pay to eat dinner. You know, that's my test. If they're not going to sit outside in front of Toshio's and eat dinner, then the main street is designed incorrectly. So what we did is we took one lane of traffic northbound and working with Kimley Horn as our sub, and we actually created this Parisian slip lane. By the way, that's also the strategy when you don't have the other side of the street. You know, you've got a railroad over here. There's, you know, you're not creating a, a, a street space through buildings. You're creating it through vertical elements in terms of the landscaping. So then we went through the process of calibrating a master plan. And by the way, we did a market study. I think it's malpractice even though your E&O carrier doesn't think so. I do. I think as a planner, urban designer, architect, it's malpractice if you're going through a design process and you're at least not trying to bootstrap some sort of market analysis before you start designing the master plan. Is it 200 townhomes or 2,000 townhomes? Well, you better not be off by a factor of 10. And so then what happens is, is the building scale, block scale master plan becomes the basis for the regulating plan. This is a frontage type form based code. We don't use those anymore. Uh, we've used some hybrids. But then if your uh, if you're frontage in the TOD area where Monty's main station is, if your property fronts onto a TOD street in the purple, then you go to the TOD section uh, in terms of building heights and transitions and looking down and plan view. Where does the building land on the lot? Where, where is the pedestrian zone and the build to zone and the transition, this being Main Street on the south side? And then where can you park? You know, very simple, basic, early form based code. But ultimately, you still have to test it back against the market. Now, what's interesting is somebody said, we'd love to have a theater here someday. And I wanted to show this particular aspect of the, co of the uh, master plan on the north end because this is one of the few locations where you're probably going to get some real assemblage of property because many of those buildings, frankly, are not even good candidates for adaptive reuse. So my recommendation is when you're going through the master planning process, differentiate in a redevelopment environment those stretches or those locations in the urban area that are likely to be good candidates for assemblage versus those areas that are likely not to be assembled just because you're going to have a lot of good incremental adaptive reuse like what Monty was doing further south. But you can see that we actually showed here in our rendering, you know, this perspective over to what would be a theater and a transition with townhomes back to the apartments over here. But see what we're doing with the very carefully integrated inter interlacing of the slip lane. So you've got two southbound here. You've got one northbound in the main commuter traffic, and then you've got the slip lane again. But then it comes back out. So using just a typical section, I think, oftentimes is very challenging within a redevelopment environment because it almost always matters from shop front to shop front and from block to block. So within this stretch, I don't have this graphic up, within this stretch, we had four different cross-sections in two-thirds of a mile for the reinvention of Main Street. 
And we conceptualized it with Kim Lee Horn, our engineer. We didn't wait for Kim Lee Horn to figure it out. We had them fully engaged in the building scale master planning process. Now, you can see our market study developed a five-year phasing uh, estimation of development potential. Phase one, five years, phase two, ten years, et cetera. You know, how much new retail, how many townhomes, how much office. You know, we thought this might become a good office location for Class B office someday, but only after the essential fabric starts to develop in terms of the restaurant and the housing. We're not there yet. Monty's got a little bit of it, but it's going to come. But the reason we went through this process is that we wanted to relate the master plan based on a market study the infrastructure needs that the master plan suggests are going to be required for redevelopment, and then the projected fiscal return to the tax base, property taxes, sales taxes, and some, some environments, hotel motel taxes. Why? Because plan A was to go get competitive money from our MPO to pay for the redo of Main Street, but plan B was the issuance of certificates of obligation or general obligation bonds so that the city could pay for it itself. And why would the city do that? Because Monty, even though he's a sophisticated developer, and even if there was a, another 10 Monty's down Main Street, they could never come together like a single owner, Greenfield, master developer, and go raise the money to put in the reinvented Main Street. So the best incentive that you can get from the public sector in the, uh, in, in the redevelopment environment is a common reinvestment of the essential street fabric that creates the common bond of the property, public realm, and private realm. And that's why the form-based code process has always got to take the street itself into consideration. And if you're being told by the public works folks, by the way, just in that stretch, we're looking at almost $3 million more a year in uh, property and sales tax, which bondable is a lot. This was the essential political tool that we needed to establish to the city council that they should spend in the common reinvention of Main Street. But because we went through this form-based process, because we are positioning Duncanville to be more competitive ultimately than many of the other communities in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and there are 275 incorporated cities in Dallas-Fort Worth, what we found was is that the discretionary funding that the COG was making available for sustainable communities development became very attractive. And we got a $1.5 million grant. The requirement, by the way, was for the developer, a developer in the corridor, which ended up being Monty, to do at least two buildings. So it's a performance-based competition. We'll give you money, our Metropolitan Planning Organization will give you Duncanville money to redo Main Street on the condition that you've already pre-wired at least two new buildings, or adaptive reuse buildings, in the context of your form-based coding. Now this is what it looked like looking southbound before we started. And on the left you can see is the Main Street side and on the right is the railroad tracks. And you can see an aerial view going northbound. You can see you know, the two lanes of traffic southbound and the two lanes of traffic northbound and then a, just a very wide strip parking lot. And this is what opened up about five months ago. Two lanes southbound, one commuter lane northbound, and then that Parisian slip lane for the first three blocks. And by the way, just down here is Monty's uh, main station. Uh, so you've got the core of it that's been redone. Uh, you have a better environment in terms of the private frontage and the public frontage in terms of that hangout factor. And you have an investment that the public sector made that could never have been done purely by the individual property owners trying to come together on their own. So this is the role of the public sector acting as the de facto master developer. They've created, we, we rezoned that entire two-thirds of a mile form-based under that illustrative master plan based on the market study, and we created the continuity of transition from property to property through that common redesign of Main Street. That to me is the future of the master developer in the modern redevelopment context. And it's already created immediate community cohesion in terms of just now, downtown is a real destination. And at the same time, there was a movement to bring in a community theater. This is right there just south of where Monty's developing his properties. And we've really set up, I think, the opportunity for some value capture in terms of some shared local commitment off that tax base to bring some local match once there is a real opportunity to extend the rail line down. So this is a TOD strategy also. The point here, though, is that we're rail ready, not rail dependent. 
think that's really, really, really important. If all we were doing was driving for this to be a TOD, I think we would be waiting and waiting and waiting. The rail will get here someday, but that doesn't mean the market's not ready for the redevelopment. So Monty's now going to talk about how he's structuring these two specific projects that are a requirement for the grant for the redesign and reconstruction of Main Street. That you said we're we're us we're a small developer, so we we've over the years being from the southern side of Dallas, we always had to do things with nothing, uh, even before the economy got bad, because it's always been so. When the economy got bad, we were prepared to, to do these kind of projects. So, what we did here, we we agreed uh, to get the 1.5 million to rebuild Main Street. We agreed to do these two mixed use buildings. And Cog, the the North Texas Council Governors made us do these. They had, they had to be mixed use. They had to be residential above had to be retail on the bottom or office or studios. And so we picked two sites that are within the, um, within the three blocks. And one of them was, a, was an infill site, as you can see right here. The rest of our development is down in this, this area here. And one of them we're going to tear down, and one of them we're going to add a second story to. So this is the first one. It's, it's a 30-foot wide lot in between two buildings, as you can see by 110 foot deep, and we're going to build 30 by 90 on that. That's 2,700 square feet. And we're going to build three stories. This is, uh, this is currently, the plans are done on this, and the financing has just been completed. So it'll have retail on the bottom, and it'll have one apartment in the back, so you can come in from the back, and six apartments, three per floor on each, uh, on each floor. And you, you'll go in the front door here, and you go in the back the same way. Today, this, this three-story building is currently on the tax rolls in Duncanville for $30,000. And when this is complete, uh, it'll be on the tax rolls for $1.1 million. Now, since uh, we don't have uh, a lot of demand for retail on this corridor, um, we, in, we came up with the city to get the $1.5 million. We came up with some down payment assistance progr uh, program for the entrepreneur, this to be an entrepreneur that would own this and manage and lease it. So uh, the, there's $291,000 in, in down payment assistance that's free money to the end user, to the entrepreneur that's the end user. Now this, these seven units equate to 92 units per acre. So we, we feel like this is, a, this is Duncanville's um, um, uh, solution to affordable housing and to density on their main street, which they thought they were built out. Well, and if I could add real quick, notice the point about 30000 today on the tax rolls versus $1.2 million. That's the analysis you have to do to justify the $291,000 being available for down payment assistance. I mean, you've got to go through the exercise of showing the economic development model that then justifies the buy-down of risk for the developer. And, and the way this actually worked, was uh, the, the 1.1 million is what the building was sold for to an end user who has to occupy the space. So immediately we just took $100,000 off the price and sold it for a million and gave uh, the end user 191,000, which was 20, roughly 20% of a down payment. And we have a local lender that's willing to do that, that kind of loan. And the second project was, uh, was another old post office, which was, which was a small, it's a 2,500-square-foot building. It's built like a fort, like the old post offices were. And this one's under construction as we speak. And we added two, we added one story onto the top. We added two apartments up there, and they're two 1,250-square-foot, two, two master bedroom, two bath uh, apartments. And on this one, um, it's studio loft space downstairs, and this one's already this one was pre-sold, and it's currently on the tax rolls for $100,000. And upon completion, it'll be on the tax rolls for $700,000. And then we had $200,000 in down payment uh, in assistance on this. And this had to be the local. You know, this these kind of projects are very hard to finance. There's no there's no system out there. So we we've we've invented our loan local on our own local credit enhancement you know cash down payment assistance for this and this one's currently under construction will be complete probably in about another three months then uh, another one of the grants that we received from the north texas council of governments uh, which is all in the same area was a uh, work live uh, townhome community this would be 31 work live townhomes and we had the, we, we, the grant we got was to redo uh, all the sidewalks and the street parking, as you can see around this project. And uh, this also had to be work-live, but 
there was no demand for any work live in the area. But to get this, to get the grants and get these, uh, these sidewalks, um, and these come from the Federal Transportation Authority also for clean air, because in Texas we had a clean air problem, so it was about creating sustainable, walkable neighborhoods. And so this will be fee simple lots. These are just like townhomes, except in the bottom floor, uh, you can use them for office, not for retail, only office. And they're very small. It's kind of like office and home. And um, if you see, here's our Main Street, um, our Main Street, Center Street, our first new project, the, the um, old post office, one of them, and this site was right, right next to all of that. Everything that we're doing is all, you know, right next to each other. And so today, this is what, this is what these look like. This is a two, one of the buildings, it's two sections, it's, you know, it's uh, like a duplex, and the office is here, and, and the live is upstairs. And then the, uh, some of the other things we're doing, this was an old church downtown right in the middle of all this property. And so we repurposed this into a dance studio, donut shop, uh, insurance agency, another real estate company, and a, and a hair salon. So this is uh, another uh, interesting thing that we're doing. We're, we're building a retail shopping center, 1,700 square feet at a time. You talk about old school, old fashioned, doing, making, um, making something happen with nothing is um, that we, we today, we're, we're needing some, some more retail and another development close by, and we found that there's nobody going to give us any speculative money to build these. So what we started off doing was building, this was the first one, this was a donut shop, and it's work live from front to back. This is 1,700 square feet, the orange brick one is. And so it's 1,000 square feet in retail. It's got head-in parking and parallel on the side street and a little apartment built on, on the back, all built at once, but to look like it was two separate buildings. And the only way to do this was to, to actually plat these lots out separately and sell it. So the donut uh, operator lives here and runs this shop, and they own that with common parking. And we just built another spec building next door, which is already sold to a CrossFit, which is like a, a boot camp type fitness place. So they bought the next building uh, here. So we'll continue on building these old school, you know, one at a time. Hopefully some of them will be able to build two-story. There'll be about 20,000 square feet of these. And eventually, it's like the, the, the donut shop, you know, when normally they go rent space in a shopping center. And then over time, they get ready to sell their, uh, their building. And what do they got to sell? You know, I mean, what do you really got to sell? You got, you know, really nothing to sell. And you sure can't finance what you're selling to somebody else. Nobody's got to buy. You know, and you're beholden to the landlord. In this case, uh, these, these little entrepreneurs have an asset they can actually sell with their business. And uh, so these, these are, this kind of stuff is really, um, um, whoops, right back here. But this, this, these are hard uh, to, to build, but we do make a little bit of profit on these when we sell them. We just build them and sell them, build them and sell them, build them and sell them, and slowly over time we'll end up with a, with a 20,000 square foot retail uh, shopping center. Um, uh, the, one of the programs that Scott and I have been working on, we've been trying to work on, uh, with um, on a national level is this is kind of like an FHA SBA loan <laughs> where you can get uh, some credit assistance uh, from either a city or the federal government where you can do a little you know so if you're a normal donut buyer or like the the buildings in Duncanville where you're buying for a million dollars normally you would have a couple of hundred thousand two hundred fifty thousand you could buy a building but not a million and so if we can get you a low down payment if we can get you a five or 10% down, down payment, and you've got good credit, then what we're doing is going to, and working with these local cities around Dallas and providing the, the credit enhancement to bridge the gap for that 35 or 40%, which a traditional banking market is going to want at this time. In fact, they're going to probably want 40% down payment for some of these entrepreneurs. And in the, some of the areas that I work, uh, we're able to slow down gentrification, you know, because we're giving, we're putting property in the hands of, of local entrepreneurs, we're, a, we're able to help them build wealth. Uh, these little units, uh, you, the multifamily session I was just in, they talked about you can't build the small units because you can't manage and lease them. Well, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, they can, they can lease and manage their own properties. And so we show them how to do that. We mentor them. And if there is no other developers, 
as the de facto master developer, we're actually helping the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker actually become the developer theirself for their own for, for their own uses. We're also helping other smaller developers uh, come in and, and like we see in our communities um, lots of people remodeling, you probably got them in your communities, they remodel old apartments, they're remodeling old houses and they're investing and they're, they're always telling me, well, well I'd like to own a new product, you know, something new. And so those are the kind of developers that we're helping create as the master developer. We're showing them how to, how to build this kind of product and what the, what the mistakes are, what we've made, how to get them financed. Because there is no good way to, to finance these right now. And so that's something that needs to be worked on. Um, in another city that we're in the process of becoming the master developer, um, in Dallas, another, it's 640 acres city, that we're, we're talking to them right now about a credit enhancement program where the city would actually guarantee a section uh, of the loan where let's say the bank would give you 50 percent of the loan you could come up with 10 percent down and then there's a local the city would actually guarantee the gap the 40 percent gap between what you what you're what you're missing there so those are some of the creative ways that we're doing these small projects and um, turn it back over to Scott yeah Monty and I, we, we wanted to talk about Duncanville as the example for form-based as the uh, form-based economic development. But this, this notion of incremental retail, I think, and we want to show these other examples where the design capacity across multiple ownership becomes the glue that binds it. Because if you were to wait for a national credit tenant or a, a small class strip mall developer to come in and try and design it the way you think it should be based on the vision for this new neighborhood that Monty's doing in the middle of Midlothian, it would never happen. Um, we call it, we call it looking, I always call it looking for the best of the worst of the tenants. And when I talk to these cities out there, they say, we'll never got to look for the worst. I said, well, then you're going to get the old beanbag chair company, the, you know, you're going to get the you know, the junk store, you know, you're never going to get anything. So we're always looking for the best of the worst to go into these areas. And I think this really is the future of this country. I mean, uh, in terms of reemploying people, this notion of incremental retail and incremental development in Main Street, it's small scale, but it's bringing back the capacity for people who normally would not have the ability to go to the bank, as Monty said themselves, and get the kind of backing they need to do something that makes sense from a risk profile standpoint, but it doesn't fit the underwriting profile of reselling debt in the secondary debt market, which is what's normally done in the underwriting. Can I resell your debt and package it and bundle it? Um, and so this is another project, a community north of a landlocked little town of 7,000, north of Fort Worth, Roanoke, Texas. And when we started a similar form-based approach in 2004, that's what Main Street looked like, Oak, Oak Street on the top. But what's interesting is you see here babes, uh, there's now a bunch of babes around Dallas Fort Worth, that's Babe's Chicken House. And Babe's was selling over 150,000 meals a year in that location in 2004. I said 150,000 meals a year, that's a lot. In a little, you know, 3,000 square foot cinder block building. People would stand on Saturdays in line in this street, and it's unclear where you park, where you walk, where, where you do anything, um, to go have lunch, and then they would leave. I mean, that is market potential. And there's a fair amount of good demographic strength around here, but people would drive up to Denton, Texas, down to Fort Worth, over to South Lake, and they would take their money from where they lived, and they would get in their car, and they would drive to other communities and spend their money. So when we went through the form-based strategy here, we really focused early on with the economic development department of the city and the city itself to begin to brand the redevelopment initiative around the notion of restaurant clusters. And today, Roanoke, Texas, is now branded the unique dining capital of Texas. And since we started the initiative and the redo of Oak Street, again, the same strategy, the public incentive, the public master developer role is the master developer code, the form-based code to create predictability and continuity from property ownership to property ownership. Uh, and then the common investment in the essential street infrastructure that creates the continuity from the private realm to the public realm and then down the block. Babes is still selling. Uh, I think they're doing closer to 300,000 meals a year. We've got 12 buildings 
that are either six adaptive reuse and six new buildings. You can see the first two-story with apartments above is going in. That was just completed. Um, the restaurants are doing from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a week a week in gross revenues. We think that we're already up almost quarter of a million three hundred thousand a year in sales tax alone. This eight million dollar investment for two thirds of a mile of Oak Street, eight million. We also move utilities you can see to the alley in the back. We didn't bury them, we just moved the alley in the back. We thought we wouldn't repay the eight million for more than twenty to twenty five years. I think we're going to repay it and far less than that. We made the strategic decision not to create a tax increment financing district, and for those of you in states where that's authorized, sometimes you've got to be careful. Because we were concerned if we created a TIF, but the value, the tax base that would have been developed and driven wouldn't have been enough to even cover the cost of the redo of Oak Street. We didn't want future city councils saying if there wasn't enough capacity to keep going further down the street, if they were doing it in phases, to say, well, you have your TIF, why would we give you anything else? So we helped the city council make the political decision to issue general obligation bonds because they're landlocked and they knew that reinventing their downtown was an economic development strategy that would benefit not just the property owners in Oak Street, but the entire community. And so we positioned this form-based redevelopment initiative is an overall city economic development strategy. Now what Monty was talking about in terms of local credit support from the communities in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we're talking to some communities about that. What I'd like us to do before we lose this HUD, USDOT, EPA partnership is go to them and say, you know, we're talking about HUD sustainability grants, community uh, development strategies, and bu busing sil down silos. Why don't we say that for any downtown or corridor or neighborhood that is mandatory, form-based, rezoned, based on a real market study, uh, based on an infrastructure stat strategy, based on a city that is going to continue to invest in the common infrastructure, you're pre-qualified if you're a property owner, building owner, within that what I'll call a livability zone for effectively an SBA loan or a 221 D3 or D4 HUD credit support loan. And all you have to do is show that you've got good credit you didn't go bankrupt. Now, why not? Because look, the market is already telling you that the risk is substantially reduced. You know, the, the, you know, are you kidding? I mean, the only reason you would go out of business in this corridor if you're opening up a restaurant is because you weren't properly managing it, not because it's not a good investment from a market or a real estate risk standpoint. Okay, four base code lessons learned in the years we've been doing this. Be very, very careful when you calibrate a form-based code or develop one that you're not engrafting greenfield rules into adaptive or redevelopment environments. What we're learning now is we're modifying some of our existing codes and updating them, which you should do, uh, is, for example, adaptive reuse requires special approaches. For example, you know, we've always had in our codes the rule that if you expand the basic building footprint, then you have to come under the new rules. And that means you might have the wrong build-to location in terms of the build-to line or the pedestrian zone or parking. Well, what if somebody just wants to add and put a little veranda on the side and do a beer garden and increase their activity and they get an old defunct, uh, you know, convenience store and they want to add to the side and make it a restaurant? Well, I'd rather have a building with an ongoing business that's non-conforming and doesn't follow the vision of the form-based plan with activity as opposed to emptying out a bunch of buildings because they're non-conforming, you're not grandfathering them for some sort of creative adaptive reuse. So when you're coding, look at things like if they add to the second floor without expanding the footprint or if they add just so, some sort of transitional expansive use, then create that as a modification that doesn't trigger the requirement to spend $500,000 to put, you know, a beer garden in, right? So that's very important. I think the other thing is, is uh, you know, a lot of us are talking about good retail, first floor heights and that sort of thing. You know, Monty, we had to modify the code for Monty because the adaptive reuse of the, one of those buildings was, it was, was it 12, 12, uh, 10 feet? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have worked. And he wouldn't have been able to do the building. Well, you know what? Okay. I'd rather have Monty investing, putting apartments above than the adaptive reuse of that building versus saying, well, unless you scrape it and do 15-foot clear floor to floor, right? So again, the code needs to reflect the reality of incremental change. Same thing with sidewalks. Uh, a lot of times you're not going to reconstruct those roadways, and sometimes requiring a new build-to line for reconstruction of a particular site may require you to pick either between parking, 
in the front or a sidewalk. And again, I think you need to bake into the rules the ability to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. A lot of times what we like to do is just to put in a provision in the code that says, here are the parking standards. Many of our codes in these environments don't even have parking requirements. But if they do, here they are, subject to an alternative parking plan or shared parking strategy or shared parking agreement uh, subject to the approval of the city manager, his or, his or her designee. You know, let the market start to work those issues out. And then finally, I've completely evolved. I think if somebody takes a non-conforming building and they, uh, you know, an old, uh, an old uh, fast food restaurant, an old convenience store, an old Class C office building, and they want to put some real money into it, but they're not changing fundamentally anything about the building. They're just in updating the inside and maybe putting a really cool restaurant in it. Uh, and they're going to spend a fair amount of money doing it. You know, our code provisions typically are based on value investment that triggers coming under the new code for, because you don't want to put people out of business. You know, if they just put an HVAC system in place or they, you know, they update the kitchen, you don't want to put the mom and pop restaurant out of business by requiring them to spend millions of dollars to update their kitchen. You want them to update their kitchen and keep the restaurant there for as long as it makes sense. Uh, I'm thinking we're moving towards maybe just completely exempting any level of investment on a pure update of any internal remodeling. Again, to encourage the advancement of incremental investment in the name of maybe not getting the design that everybody thought was appropriate under the form-based vision. The summary of our strategy here is, you know, more universally, um, look for and encourage the developer catalyst project. Uh, you don't have to wait for the planning and the zoning and the big vision to be implemented. There's probably already somebody out there either thinking about it or already trying to do something. Immediately encourage them and support them. Now, Monty was already underway. We just took advantage of Monty's momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you, but you do. If, it is good if you, if you even if it's even if it's nothing but restoring an old building right now. Just getting anything that you can get going. Time is time is everything. So if Scott comes to town. You know, does the does the planning, and then all of a sudden, some buildings getting uh, restored or repurposed or or uh, redone. It really helps. It really helps the momentum get started, and before you can, as you get started into building new product. But right in that, right now, with in the areas that we're that we're working in in South Dallas and in most Main Street Americas, there is no money. I mean, there's no money. There's not enough rents. And uh, and there's not enough, um, you, you know, there, most of these small entrepreneurs that are ready to do this don't have enough credit. So as long as you can get something going, we we always say we have to have something being rebuilt or built all the time. But to even before yeah. the form-based process and the rezoning, remember Monty just by putting in the correct building form, mixed use, taking advantage of the public space in front of Main Station, he's getting $16 a foot on that block for his retail space versus six just a block over. So the rent potential is what you need to look at. By just changing the design. Just changing the design and programming it correctly. Uh, the form-based code Main Street initiatives are ultimately more about economics than just aesthetics. Just planting pretty trees and doing facade improvements are not going to change the fundamental economics that are often creating the wrong kind of inertia. The code maintains the de facto master developer momentum. That's really the role of the form-based code. Set up competitive advantage for your regional transportation dollars. The way to sell this, you know, investing in that part of town, why would we do that? You know, let the developers do that. If the market's there, the developers can do that. Well, because you can actually attract more money that's going to be more and more based out there from the feds and the state and the regions on competitive, show me the outcome. Show me that you're going to leverage my surface transportation multimodal money or my enhancement money in a way that the community down the street is not by just putting in sidewalks and thinking that just putting in sidewalks alone is going to make a difference. The city's role, great streets and buying down the cost of development so that you can begin to close the gap of the mismatch of cost and the rent potential. And then finally, this is an open source for other developers. This is not the Monty program. This is Monty's leadership opening the door for others and then in the form-based environment every incremental project begins to add value to one another. And so the key here is the more that come in, this is not about, you know, uh, I'll use a, a defunct group. It's not about, you know, assembling a bunch of property and giving it to Cherokee and hoping they put it all together. This is the opposite. This is creating the environment for the small business person, the small investor, and the small developer to deploy to the market what it's actually already 
asking for and is already available for. Mm -hmm. It's it's really just an open source strategy more than anything. Yeah, the next the city next door to us, uh, Trammell Crow, they they got to seeing what we were doing over in Duncanville. It's another little city, and tra they got Trammell Crow to come to town to build a uh, mixed use twenty five million dollar mixed use development over there. They gave them they had to give them twelve and a half million dollars. So this was this was small, and then it, then they did it wrong, and it fell. It's not working on top of that. So. Well, that's uh, the story we have to offer today. Are there any questions or comments? Sure. General obligation bonds versus a TIF. Yeah, more and more what's happening is is that we did we let's assume that over twenty years the TIF would have generated say four to five million dollars in tax revenue that we could commit to the project. It's an eight to ten million dollar project, and our estimates are conservative estimates. The question is why did you not use a TIF versus general obligation bonds? We were afraid that if we ran out of money based on the political excuse that well, we gave you the TIF, we diverted some of the general fund money into the TIF district. If we ran out of money, then that was the excuse for future city councils to say, well, you got the TIF, and if it didn't perform and there's not enough money to finish it out, that's your problem. So what we did is we sold, sometimes it makes sense to do tax increment financing districts. In this case, we sold the council, which ultimately sold you know the public, that issuing general obligation bonds that are backed by the full faith and credit of Roanoke itself made sense because even if you directly weren't a property owner down on Oak Street, the overall economy and tax base of Roanoke is going to benefit from that investment. So sometimes you really need to make the case that this investment for a particular part of town is actually a benefit for everybody and the full faith and credit and the general backing of the city is justified. So the question is, are you getting the same deal every time in terms of what do we mean by open source? Yeah, no, it's not going to be the same. It'll, it'll be less probably. You know, I mean, you hope it's – this is not the normal way of doing business. I mean, philosophically, I'm against this, you know, against even taking that money. I mean, I, but you hope that this is, this is the first one. They had a trade-off. They had to build these two buildings in this economy right now. They had to build them right now. And that – was why they I, when when I talked to Duncan Mellon, I said you have to do this. So it's totally transparent, public meetings, you know, through it's through. It's linked to the it's linked to the grant money. Then. It's linked to the grant money, and the money is not going to the you know so-called rich develop you know rich developer. The money is actually going to uh, the end user, to the entrepreneur uh, that goes in there. So uh, what we think in this open source development and these kind of uh, um, pro projects actually the developer could be the donut maker i mean it could be it could be it could be somebody with just a few units out there that wants to put their bu their business here because there's not a lot of developers that do this kind of work as a master developer we help them and assist them and guide them into the traps that uh, that they cuz in uh, you know the, you're not going to get institutional money or you know this wall street you know money you you know you're not going to get that you know we're 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 really dealing with people that are already there in the community to get this and everything is everything is is those are all public meetings and you you're not getting anything in the back you know in the back room or well, anything well so. in Roanoke what we mean by open source is that the common investment in the public paid for the rezoning so that we added value to the private property owners whether or not they want to take advantage the public paid for the redesign and reconstruction of Oak Street to be a match to the form-based vision. And some early incentives, some early reimbursements were offered to some of the first retailers, first restaurateurs to come in. But now the market is on, uh, you know, um, uh, autopilot. And so there's no need to offer the cash incentive anymore. 
And so I think the point is to view the cash incentive pieces as the seeds to close that gap between the cost of entering the market on the development side and the rent rates that can be achieved by the property owner or the landowner. But the open source aspect is combining the reinvention of the essential street infrastructure and the zoning so that you can have 20 property owners function as if there was one property owner. Yeah. Any, there's questions back over here? No? Hey, but yeah, yes, sir. Hey, Steve. Um, you know, it's interesting. The question is, were both the projects based in growth? No growth in Duncanville, uh, but inert spending in the, in the region. In other words, just because you don't have, quote, growth in that submarket, that doesn't mean that there's not an economy that's not leaking out. So the, Duncanville was taking advantage of the spending power leaking out. Roanoke was uh, a similar story in the context of growth, but the growth up here, Class A office campus, industrial, uh, high-end national credit tenant strip, uh, and what we did was we took advantage of the desire for authentic living in an area where it was just bedroom communities and high-end corporate sprawl. And so two different parts of town, uh, two different parts of the region, but the same strategy worked in those two different contexts. I don't know, yeah. Monty, if you have a right. In Duncanville, um, it's interesting because there's 50,000 you know, 50, people and basically 11 square miles there, and they think they were, they're built out, you know, which they're not. But what happened there was uh, I, I was asking, uh, I asked the city manager and the council, and I said, well, what's, what's, the number, what's the biggest industry we have in town? And they said, well, the school district or this cabinet shop. or this. I said, no, that's, you're wrong. You have 50,000, your, your neighborhoods, that's the industry. And so what are we going to plug in? For, for this neighborhood to spend you know, right now in the core. What's happened now in Duncanville over the last seven years is they've started to grow. Because they're a first ring suburb that's, that's 12 minutes from downtown Dallas, 25 minutes from DFW Airport. Now all the, like the, the hipster kids are coming back home and actually moving into these lofts. They just didn't want to live in any of the suburban, you know, Class B, Class C apartments. They wanted to live in something, something cool. And we could offer them uh, a, a type of product here that was 30% higher in downtown Dallas. And so we offered them a good product and a product where they could kind of come back I, home. That, I think that's the common denominator. Are you attracting the gap back from, you know, kids grow up, they go to college, and they never come back? or they just happen to be there because that's where their job landed in the last time when they retire. This strategy is attracting the 20-somethings and 30-somethings, the pioneers that want to go back into urban areas, but maybe they can't afford nor want to be in the big city centers. I think that's why, as an organization, the Congress for the New Urbanism really needs to continue to speak to the suburbs and the exurban areas, whether they're growing or not, as opportunities for walkable urbanism from an economic development standpoint. Don't give up on them in the name of, well, that's sprawl, and we shouldn't even be doing anything out there. And you know, the interesting thing about this Main Street in Duncanville, too, the neighborhoods that are directly around this this uh, are very affordable neighborhoods, and they all got a perfect grid system. And you know, they got the the sidewalks are you know uh, there's green space between the sidewalks and the curbs, and unlike the ones that are farther out where there's bad sidewalks and bad streets. And so there's all these great neighborhoods that this is now influencing. That you we were we're actually selling uh, houses in that area for fifty dollars a square foot, good houses. And now those houses are eighty dollars a square foot. That's still not very high, but they're they're go they're heading they're heading up. There's a gentleman back here, then Gianni. Yeah, um, oh, Andrew. Well, we uh, did a downtown redevelopment plan and rezoned 100 blocks of Owensboro, Kentucky, and the Ohio River, which is not near anything. Uh, in the recession in Western Kentucky, and it's working. They've they've had over 100 different ap applications and permits for the form-based code in the four years that it's been on the ground. There's over 100 million dollars of public infrastructure being invested. So, I I, I think this applies wherever people want to live. I mean, maybe that's not directly responsive to your question, but Steve's point was, is this dependent on growth? The, I think the answer is no. It's dependent on, are you taking advantage of your economy that's in place? 
or are you waiting for somebody else to bring in a silver bullet? To me, that's the beauty of the form-based economic development strategy. And I really, really hope that we begin to reposition it out there in the marketplace as such, because it buys down risk in terms of just the real estate and market risk because you get shared outcomes. Bankers love that if they understand it. By the way, in Owensboro, we invited the bankers of the seven banks, including U.S. Bank, the presidents, to come and begin early on with our process. By the end of this project, they actually created a shared low interest low pro loan program for redevelopment in downtown Owensboro because they realized that actually now the best place to put their money at risk in real estate is in downtown Owensboro. Not the next, you know, single uh, housing type uh, subdivision or the next, quote, national credit tenant deal. Um, yeah, those, those are still going to be products that are going to be available in every marketplace, but this is an opportunity to show the investment community that what we do as New Urbanist is actually about risk reduction. It's not just about aesthetics. And I think that needs to be our message going forward. I, I think you, it's some of those downtowns too, not to interrupt, but I think that you can get, you know, there's, there's I mean, senior housing ought to be built down there in smaller pieces that I'm working uh, right now with uh, some down, down syndrome adults and their parents are, you know, are figuring out where these where these people got to go. And in addition, in Duncanville, you may think I'm crazy when I say this, but we're, we took uh, some old apartments and rehabbed them very close. Another uh, developer did. And we've got transitional, um, I mean, we got, you know, transitional prisoner, I mean, prisoners that were, were like drug dealers and prostitutes and that are in their transition. And they've had to earn their way into these units. But again, it's the best of the worst, and they're they're actually we're putting them in small doses back into the back into our downtown, and and this city's kind of in, not I wouldn't say they've embraced it I won't say that yet uh, we're getting we're getting used to it and actually we're I think we've become more compassionate and these people are getting mixed in to, to the community and I think they got a better chance of actually getting back into the society in, in a better way. You know, Ford Foundation is talking about their investment back in the cities and the, the, the grants they're making, their foundational grants they're making. They really want to focus on equity. I mean, what better equitable story can you tell than what Monty just said? You've got a redevelopment strategy. You're actually creating an environment where you're rehabilitating people and you're giving them a reason. Is there risk involved? Of course. Uh, Gianni? For some early projects. Uh -huh. okay. so, so that's and I think that one goes away at some point. Okay. Well, then you added another question I was going to ask. First of all, I was going to ask, uh, is there like a healthy ratio that you learn between the public investment and private investment, and then at the end, the down payment assistance? And kind of a rule of thumb. And then when does the down payment assistance go away? That's, that's interesting. I, I'll, I'll defer to Monty on the down payment assistance because I don't think we have enough experience with that to actually have a rule of thumb yet. Yeah. But on the question of the public investment side and the infrastructure, my sense of it is is that one generation, life, one life cycle, one generation, 20 years approximately is a rule of thumb. Um, you know, we're kind of looking at if you can show a payback within that period from the tax base that we think cannot otherwise occur. It's not like you're taking money from the general fund that's already going to be there. We're generating value because uh, in Roanoke, for example, you know, we're getting young families and developers coming in and opening up restaurants in a market that otherwise they would never be there. So this is new money. So for me, if you can show the payback for the project itself uh, somewhere between you know, 15 and 20 years, I think that's a good rule of thumb. However, if you have a project where it's your, actually, it's your downtown, now if it's just an aging, aging commercial corridor and you can't show that the economics work for that corridor or it's not a special corridor like 
um, the experience we had recently in a master plan for Broadway in San Antonio, which anchors three universities and major museums. But if it's just an aging commercial corridor and you can't show payback within that time frame, whatever it might be, I think you've got to be very careful about whether or not that's justified. But if it's your downtown, the economic benefit is much broader. Now here's what's happening in Roanoke. There's 40 acres at the end of Oak Street. It's been sitting there. It's now under contract. We're looking at probably a developer that's going to do 60,000 square feet of retail, 100,000 square feet of Class B office, and 500 multifamily units. We think that the 100,000 square feet of office is going to be filled. Anybody from California here? We're, he's getting calls from California corporate reload guys saying, we want to be up in that market in North Texas, but we don't want to be in a sterile Class A corporate campus environment. We're getting people who want to be in a corporate environment where their employees can actually walk out of the office building and three blocks down the street and actually hang out on Oak Street. And so now the redevelopment strategy based on infill residential and restaurants has become a competitive advantage. It's starting to emerge. We'll see how it plays out. For Roanoke in corporate campus relo, it's not a lot of square footage, but it's enough to make a difference in terms of a town of 7,000. Put another 100,000 square feet of, of, of good office in place. Monty, you might want to either address the office. Well, Duncanville got one and a half million dollars to rebuild three blocks. For that, they had to give up 490,000. So they had to give up 490,000 in down payment assistance to get these two buildings built. So they got, they got, they net one one point one million in addition to that what happened um, in conjunction with all this is that we had a Hilton hotel move move in at the end of our main street in our freeway our i-20 freeway and put a hundred and eighty room hotel in that's currently running at about seventy percent occupied that happened during this process and then just recently we had a, um, a, a, ref a trucking refrigeration company uh, also putting their headquarters on our North Main Street in uh, with 100 jobs with a $5 million annual payroll. And I, I promise you these other things wouldn't have happened if this wasn't happening down there. Now, that, we didn't even get to the sales tax created, you know, from the retail, but there's about, uh, like in Main Station, uh, the, the 22,000 square foot building, there's about 35,000 in sales tax that the city gets. The city gets 2%. In Texas, they get 2% on sales tax. And they get about 30, uh, 35000 is what I, I'm hearing uh, the most recent, a year. They're collecting off that one uh, little building. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a real estate guy, okay, investment guy. To me, everything that everyone puts into any of these projects has to have return. The city owes it, you know, to justify this return. So we, we didn't look very far out. We just said, what can we get? right now what do we get next year and then the others that you know these fancy pro formas and you know all that stuff out there i mean it's just you know it's just hocus pocus really i mean we've seen our country go through all of that you know all of that and what's that i mean we want to get what can we get right now what can we trade what can we get today and so um, we'll see more uh this has been going on since 2004 and we'll you know, we'll be able to tell. But the down, the down payment assistance, those kind of things, you know, must go away. Your city can't, you know, survive giving those kind of um, percentages, you know, to I, them. I think uh, two more people and then we'll have to close it. But, but I, I do want to underscore something. Um, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, you, how many times have you been in a, a presentation at one of these conferences and, Somebody says, you know, make sure you get the public works person or the fire marshal in early on so that, you know, they don't blow you up because they don't understand it. You better have the director of economic development at the beginning of every one of these projects, too, because if not, you're just missing the boat. Uh, gentleman here and then mayor. Oh, I saw, I'm sorry, Will. I didn't see it was you. No, but that's Which a great idea. That? Oh, well, it could have been. You could create a revolving fund. We're talking about doing that now, don't we? Yeah, yeah. It we didn't do it on. You know, as you know, we didn't do it on these. You know, but 
it, it could be it could have been a th th that money uh, could still be on the second uh, project could still be a loan. I, I think that's the way to do it. I mean, if you want to keep that capacity in place, that's the only way to justify it. Um, Mayor. The Economic Development Corporation. Economic Development it was Corporation. Done legally through yeah. a state chartered adopted economic development authority. City can't do it. That, collect, do it that collects its own tax. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that. The city decides who gets it and how much. They appoint the board, so effectively they do. Yeah. They, then the board makes a recommendation, the city council approves approves that. In, in some cities they don't, but in Texas, but that's in this city, the city council did approve. No, in, in the Duncanville case, we didn't have to uh, fully uh, because we got a grant. They made up the difference. In Roanoke, they actually did because we made the case that they'll actually get more return citywide than it would cost them. What I'm saying is just be careful that you don't always define the return on investment within the plan area. If you, know, if you can show that you know, reinventing your core is going to lead to maybe new employers outside of downtown, there's nothing wrong with that. However, if you're going to be spending money on essential place and reinventing it and doing retrofits, the most important reason to have your economic development people at the table with you is when they're doing corporate relo, you, you pretty much would like for them to actually start looking at that same location and give it preference and encourage it. That's, there's a lot of communities that are having, you know, they've got the economic development folks that are doing corporate recruiting over here and the planning department, you know, and the, and the public works department are spending money and working on placemaking over here, but they're not talking to each other about recruiting maybe that corporate reload person to come into that investment that you're making over there. So be very careful that that's not happening. Oh, by the way, Duncanville, when we started this process in 2003, Duncanville had a, it's, you know, it's a little town, had about $27, $28 million in debt. By the, they have today, they have $2.1 million in debt. By the year 2015, they'll be completely debt-free as a city. And that was a totally unexpected, you know, result. Okay. I just think it's really a challenge to convince a city council that they're going to put out support for this project and then have it go through the Well, we still came close to justifying, you know, in Roanoke that that would be, that we would get close to making a difference. But this is their downtown. I don't think you can make that in every location. On the down payment assistance program in Duncanville, Monty already said it. I mean, the only way we got that support is because by putting that money out there, we got a million and a half dollar check back from the Council of Governments. All right, thank you all very much.